Hello and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce Odyssey podcast. I'm here from, with Valon from Bahamics and we're going to talk about how to minimize cart abandonment. So I think let's let's start with the basics. How big is the problem of cart abandonment, Valon? Hey, hey, Trevor. Thanks for thanks for having me here. Um, the cart abandonment is a big is a big problem. Like usually you see numbers which are like seventy percent of carts are abandoned, and this is pretty much standard. Pretty much. Standard standard with a, a bit of a difference, a variety across different industries, but that's how big the problem is. So this is costing uh, shoppers and this is costing not only shoppers, but also like shops a lot of um, uh, billions per year, um, especially these days, um, because before there was this conception that, hey, um, we can bring more traffic, we can drive more traffic to the store, and this is how we grow. But now traffic has become very expensive, especially with these uh, updates in privacy from Apple and other like Google and other big, big players in the game. So it's become more and more expensive to drive traffic to the store. And with this, car abandonments are becoming a bigger problem in e-commerce. So would you say that, I mean, what do we mean by car abandonment? Because obviously you know, you've got a, uh, you've got the cart, right? And then you've got the checkout and then at what point would you say, are we talking about people not completing the buying process or are we talking about people adding things to their cart and not going to the checkout and not buying things? What would you, how would you measure it? So the, the car, the car abandonment, the car abandonment rate or the car abandonment is the process when a, uh, when a user uh, or a visitor, they add something to the cart and then at some point in time during the shopping process, they just uh, leave the store without buying. And this can be that, this can be, um, they are just browsing around, they add a product to the cart, this can be they go to the cart and then they ban, they, they leave the store. And this can even go further than just going to the payment page and then starting to add the details and then they just leave the store. So pretty much a car abandonment is considered everything uh, as soon as you add a product to the car, then you leave the store. That's pretty much the definition of the car abandonment. Okay. So does this vary across platform at all? Because we've got a, my e-commerce business has got a Shopify store. And the reason that we, one of the reasons we moved to Shopify is because it has a, their standard checkout. Does that, does that help? Um, well, I mean, based on the definition of the car abandonment, um, which is again, like adding a product to the car and leaving at some point or some page within the store, it doesn't really have to be on the payment. It can be also like, you don't go to the payment at all. Uh, and this means that this means that the payment page is not the only solution. You can try to optimize a payment page, but the problem is that the car abandonment starts as soon as the consumer adds something to the cart which means that you can optimize a payment page, but you can have other pages like the card or the product detail page, which are not like optimized and they need some, some optimization, which can cause a car abandonment. So you need to kind of like work on all different pages to try to optimize this. It's not, it's not enough just having a great page pretty much. So it's the flow, you've got to work on the whole flow, purchase flow throughout the site. The whole funnel pretty much, yeah. Okay. So why why do what are the main reasons why cart abandonment take place? Um, there are like two two categories or two main reasons why car abandonments uh, take place. The first the first is um, there are issues within the store. There are errors. There are bugs. The user interface is not good. Um, for example, you go to the payment page, you click uh, pay, and it, it doesn't go through. Or you add a product to the cart, it doesn't go through or you want to remove a product from the card and then go to the payment detail pay, to, to the payment page and it doesn't work. So pretty much these bugs, these errors, these API failures, these user interface failures are one of the reasons why um, cards are abandoned. So this is more the technical perspective. And the second reason is the behavioral perspective. We're talking here about like consumers have difficulty of making a decision. So it's more in the behavioral psychology perspective. So what happens within the store is that uh, users or buyers have to make a lot of decisions. For example, if I look for a t-shirt and I go to the t-shirts page, you usually see like 20 to four different t-shirts, which are pretty much similar. Hmm. So for me as a user, it's really hard to make a decision. And this is something what's called paradox of choice. When you have so many options to choose from and you get suffocated in the decision-making process. So what happens here is like you pick two or three products 
and then you add them to the card so that when you go to the card, maybe hopefully you can make a decision there. Mm-hmm. When you go to the car, when you go to the car, what usually happens is that you're in the decision-making process to pick, to decide which t-shirt to pick. And then you have shops or brands trying to upsell to you with similar options by recommending you additional stuff. And this actually suffocates you more because the more decisions you have to make, the harder it is. And we as humans, um, we make easier decisions when we have less options. The more okay. options we have, the more the harder it's for us to make a decision. And again, as humans, we like to push the decision making as much as possible in the future. Mm-hmm. So because you have this paradox of choice, because you have to make so many decisions within the store, users pretty much leave the store without buying because again, it's hard to make a decision when you have to pay something. Okay. So th- these are like two different uh, reasons why um, users abandon the car. It's from the behavioral, it's from the technical perspective, issues, bugs, but it's also from the behavioral perspective, behavioral psychology perspective. Okay. So what are the, you told me earlier, there are some misconceptions about cart abandonment. What are, what are these things and uh, what are the things that people think about a cart abandonment which aren't actually right? So the, the biggest the biggest misconception that is out there, and this is more from the brand perspective, is that um, when users add, add a product to the car, brands or shops think that the user has an intent to buy the product. So that's why they try to to push the user to buy to add more products so that they can hopefully hopefully buy. The card is actually a wish list, is a short list of products you want to buy. Mm-hmm. So when I go around, because I said I have so many options to choose from, I don't know which one to pick. So what I usually do is like I pick two, three different t-shirts and I add them to the car. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to buy these two or three different t-shirts. It just means that I'm short listening. I'm short listing the options where I have to make a decision. Instead of making a decision out of four different t-shirts, I pick three, I add them to the car. And then when I go to the card, I have only three options to choose from. And the, bis- the big mi- misconception here is that um, I'm going to buy all three of them. No, that's not really the case. It's just about short listening uh, the options I can make decisions from. So this is the biggest misconception. Um, the other big misconception that leads directly to car abandonment is that is the belief that upselling is great or upselling is good. Upselling is definitely good. It's really important, increase your revenue, it increase um, all the KPIs you need, but you need, to do, you need to know when to do the upselling. For example, if, um, if you try to upsell a lot, you can actually lose the consumer because you're just suffocating the consumer with more and more options to choose from. If I have a budget to buy only t-shirt and I go to the car and then suddenly I see more options, I get more confused. And then what happens is like I just leave without buying. So pretty much in the upselling terms, you have to understand when to upsell and when to stop upselling and focus on closing the deal, closing the order. So this is a another big, big misconception. The other big misconception that is that leads also carbon is that is that providing more options to the user, more options, I mean more options in terms of, of product listings, more options in terms of payment options, more options on delivery options, you know? these will lead to um, less car abandonments and higher revenue. This is also partially false and partially true because going back to the what I said earlier, users usually abandon the car because they have so many options to choose from and we as humans are, are really bad at making decisions when we have a lot of options. So the more options you provide, the more decision has user to make, which means that the user will just get suffocated and then will leave the store. So pretty much... Uh, this the, when the process is simple, when the users have to make less decisions, when you support the users to make less decisions, then users make faster decisions, and then this can lead to uh, a sale instead of a car abandonment. If we talk about, for example, let's say payment options. Payment options is a really really good topic, and you actually brought it up um, before the call uh, because there is a misconception that if you provide more payment options this will increase revenue. Yes and no, because the user has to go to this and say, okay, which one is the best one to make this purchase? Is it like buy now, pay later? Is it through PayPal? Is it like credit card, whatever? So why, for example, would you provide a buy now, pay later 
if I'm about to buy a t-shirt with like $10, $10. why mm -hmm. do I have to see this option? So what I mean by this is that you need to support your consumer. If you know that the consumer won't buy or won't pay through buy now, pay later option, why do you have to list this as an option? Just help the consumer to have less options to make the decision faster. Okay. So this so is it's kind of like a support or, yeah. So what are the solutions that you, you would recommend to reducing a card abandonment? So we're talking about the problems. Let's move on to the solution. Yeah. So the, the solution, they, they depend on which of the car abandonment reasons you want to solve. So if we're talking about the technical, the technical uh, issues, so you really have to have in place a system that tracks all these issues and then attributes these issues to the car abandonment. For example, every single every single error or bug or whatever API failure can be attributed to the car abandonment. And then you go and fix these. And the thing here, it's really important that whenever you change something within your store, regardless if you use Shopify or Magento or whatever, um, whenever you push something new or something, the chances of an error taking place are very high. For example, if you add videos to the product detail page, you believe that this is going to increase the revenue, but this can fire back because you might have the videos might be too large. They can slow down the page. Maybe they fail to load and this can fire back on your revenue. So for that reason, you need to constantly check for these errors, monitor these errors and fix them right away because this can cause you a lot of harm. And based on our estimates, usually these account for 30 to 40% of the total car abandonments. Or technical technical errors. Exactly, yes. And a lot of stores, a lot of clients that we work with, big mid and price, uh, mid size enterprise level, they have a lot of issues, a lot of errors, technical errors. And we tell them, hey, you have these errors and they're causing you car abandonment rate. Right? They they are not aware how severe the impact of these errors are. And mm -hmm. that's why it's really important to have a tool in place to be able to see which error is causing you how much money to, and damage and go and fix them and escalate the problems. So this is the most important thing, constantly monitoring for errors and having a system that monitor, does this monitoring system and fixing them right away. Because you might think that this don't have a lot of impact, but they do. Because if an error happens on the payment page, is this can pretty much lose you like a sale. Mm -hmm. So this is the first solution, the technical, the technical reasons or the, the, the re to tackle the reasons that are because of technical issues. And the other solution regarding the behavioral part, the behavioral users, in that case, the most important thing is to make the process as simple as possible and use, let's say, AI-driven system to predict if the user is going to uh, buy with a credit card or buy now pay later options. And if you see that, hey, the user is going to buy with credit card, not a buy now, pay later, then you should not provide this option of buy now, pay later because you're just going to confuse the user. Or if you believe that the user is ready to buy and doesn't have a chance of adding more products, then you should stop upselling because you just confuse the user. So these are like some, some options that you can actually provide to tackle the behavioral, the behavioral side of so the You're saying it's AI-like... Uh, you, can you recommend any AI, to, AI tools which do this? Um, maybe I'm going to be a bit biased here, uh, <laughs> but but yeah, I mean that's uh, that's what we do at Behemix. So pretty much at Behemix, we have this system in place that um, predicts, does all these predictions, and decides: okay, should we list the buy now, pay later option for this user or not, or should we stop upselling now or not, or should we simplify a process or not? Right, so. This is pretty much what BMX does, like does all these predictions to understand what, how to actually provide less option to the user so that the process, the buying process is as simple as possible. Okay. So what would this, uh, your, I mean, just, just getting you know, from a kind of a basics point of view, because I mean, uh, if you're a, a smaller business and you, the, I'm guessing there's some things that you could probably do first, right? What are they? You, you were talking about um, earlier about how, um, it's in, you know the, the upselling and stuff like that are the very simple things which people can do which kind of almost mimic you know there's a kind of first step before they look at using a tool like yours uh, pretty much go uh, go and monitor the the technical errors the technical issues 
uh, and fix them right away. But not not do just like one time fix and that's pretty much it. But like constantly monitor for these because these can happen all the time. Okay. First, make sure that you um, you track whether your product images are loading. Second, make sure that these product images they're not large so that they can slow down your page. Third, mm -hmm. so these are like things that you can actually monitor constantly and you have to make sure that you fix them right away. There is a conception that um, these don't really cause a lot of harm, you know, whatever, but they do. Like a failed image, this can cause a lot of harm. It's actually one of the most common issue that happens out there that actually can cause a lot of harm mm -hmm. in your sale and whatever, because it doesn't look good. The user doesn't see the product. Why the user would add this product to the car when there's a failed image or the image is not loading. And this can happen very frequently. So this is these are like some technical issues that you can actually fix and monitor constantly and fix them right away. This is the first part. And from the other part, the behavioral part, just try to make the process as simple as possible. Don't try to suffocate the user with like 10 different payment options with trying to upsell all the time, you know, like trying to provide a lot of products, just make the process as simple as possible and try to, to, to advise and support the user. Cause that's, that's the most important thing. The user has a short time window on your, on your, on your shop. They have usually like five, six minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, if they, if, if they are about to buy, but usually they have like two, three minutes. So this is the most important part. If, your shop is complex, a lot of options, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of um, um, different banners, whatever. They just get confused and they leave the store without buying. Okay. So the, the best, the best systems out there are the ones that are simple. Okay. Fast. So keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, that's yes. pretty much it. So I've got a question. So talking about payments, how many payment options would you would you recommend? And what are the uh, what are in terms of conversion? What are the most important options to have? And what, you know, what would you recommend to someone just saying, okay, I need to choose my payment options? Um, so the, there is a correlation that the more options you add, um, the better revenue or the higher revenue is going to be. This is, or the conversion rate. This is, a, there is a correlation there. Uh, but again, there is no, uh, no option or no solution to fix everything. Because uh, there is no average user. The average user doesn't exist. So there are users who would like to buy with uh, a buy now, pay later option. There are users who buy with um, cards. So this completely depends on the user behavior during the shopping process. Again, if I if I am about to buy a T-shirt, which is like ten dollars, I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna use buy now, pay later option. Okay. So what do you say? I mean, okay, just talking generically, right? Uh, you know, coming from a veil of ignorance. What would you say as a starting off point would be the best payment options? So the first starting point would be to see uh, the product. So there are like two KPIs um, that you need to measure uh, to in your store to decide about the payment options. And the first is like how big the average or value is. Yeah, this is a, a real important thing because again, for low uh, low price products or low cards or low orders. You don't need a buy now pay, uh, pay later option. So what would be low, like fifty dollars or something, or yeah, fifteen, fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars. That's pretty much it. So right. this is something that is real important. If you have like uh, big orders or large orders in this case, then you would need to add the buy now pay uh, later option. But if it's a small order, you have to really make sure, okay, which one, which one is the which one, which payment option is the fastest one. Again, uh, just imagine a scenario. You have to understand your user before, of course, you make a decision. But like, imagine a scenario. Uh, I sell T-shirts, ten bucks, fifteen bucks, twenty bucks, and usually I have one to T-shirts per order that are purchased. So this user is a user that probably is riding the subway, going to work, saw an ad from your shop, and clicked the ad and added the T-shirt to the cart, and it's about to buy. I have, I don't have a lot of time. If I don't close this purchase during this subway ride, I just go to work and forget the whole thing. Right. So if you add, if you ask me a lot of options, like, uh, do you want to log in or log out? You know, do you want to create an account? 
this and that, and let's go with buy now, pay later option where you have to be forwarded to a different page, probably. Yeah. You know, these are like these are like time consuming pains. So you have to understand the user. If the user is the one that is uh, a user that makes a fast purchase and a small purchase, then you have to provide options that uh, are easy and and quick fix, like let's say PayPal or even a credit card, or whatever. But if our if you are selling big orders, where the user usually purchase through desktop or shops through desktop computer or something, then they have enough time because they're like just sitting uh, on a sofa, just enjoying their time, browsing around. They have enough time to go through buy now, pay later options. So this is the most important thing, understanding your user, how fast do they make decisions? How fast do they purchase the, 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 the order? So these are like KPIs that they have to measure before deciding for, um, for a payment option. So there is no... There is no solution to fix everything too much. Okay. Okay. So what about um, shipping? Would you would you say that offering free shipping is a way to reduce abandonment? It is, but it's uh, this can also fire back. So car abandonments, car abandonments are directly connected with product returns. So if you try to push the users on site a lot to purchase the sale without them being sure that they want the product, and this can be done, for example, by providing a coupon. Let's imagine a scenario, a user, I come to your store and I see two products or three products and I go to the car, but I'm still unsure about these products. But then you have, let's say, a tool that provides me a coupon intelligently, you know? And I was like, oh, good. I'm going to get the coupon because I get like 20% discount. I buy these three because I know that there is also free shipping. And then when I have these three t-shirts, because again, I'm not interested to buy three t-shirts, but just because I was unsure which t-shirt to pick and I had a free shipping and I had a coupon discount, I bought three of them. I take them at home. I make the decision. I keep one, ship two back. So what happens here is that your return rate, your product return rate increases a lot, mm. increases so much so much that you actually will lose money if right. you do the whole math. Right. And that's what actually happens with a lot of big uh, fashion stores. So what we have seen from our data is that, is that when coupons are provided and pre-shippings are provided, usually product return rates, they skyrocket, mm -hmm. which, means, which means that this will cause them to lose money instead of making money because every product that is returned it's less likely to be sold again as new because it's open, it's tried on. There are so many things you have then the shipping costs to, to ship the product to the consumer, to ship the product back, to refurnish, repackage them, hopefully resell it. So that's kind of like the math behind it because a lot of brands, a lot of store owners, they don't actually, they only do the math on site. Okay, I'm providing coupons, I'm providing sh free shipping costs, Great, my uh, my revenue is, is is increased, but you, in order to do the whole math, is you have to also include the returns on the analysis and see mm -hmm. okay which one makes sense. And if you include the returns, this one makes sense pretty much. So shipping is something that you really have to see. Do you have high return rates? If you have high return rates, it's not always good to provide shipping, free shipping. Um, if you have low return rates. And even if you increase a bit the, the returns, uh, it won't cause you a lot of harm. Then you can provide free shipping. So it's a matter of it's a matter of understanding your your store, understanding your users, understanding your KPIs, and then seeing okay which one makes sense um, from that perspective. Very much, yeah. So what about um, obviously abandoned cart emails are very popular uh, as a popular way of uh, what would you how would you optimize a abandoned cart email? What would you put in it? So the the the, uh, the the emails are really they used to work a lot in the last um, like two three years ago. These days, what we see what we see from the data, which is really interesting, apparently users have understood the trick. So they abandon the cards. In some cases, they abandon the cards on purpose because they know that they'll receive an email with potentially a coupon on it. Right. So. We have seen from the data, we have seen a lot of cases um, to the clients where they use these type of emails. And we've seen that consumers, they ban the cards on purpose. 
even if they have a high probability of buying, they abandon it on purpose, just that they get the email and then they come back with a coupon and then they add the coupon and then they buy without, uh, pretty much with a coupon. Mm-hmm. So they are good. They are good. They work, but they don't work as they used to before because of this. Getting savvy. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's tough times, Trevor. Tough times. <laughs> it is to. definitely. Tough like times. Of, inflation, like inflation is high. Inflation, inflation is high. Um, everything is expensive. Um, markets are going down. Um, yeah, so they have to find ways to uh, those pesky, to, pesky customers. To, so, what about to, okay? So uh, I, I've got another question for you. Um, shipping options. I mean, how do you communicate? Because I, I believe that you know that that. When people get the get the uh, the checkout, they're surprised by the shipping, and that's a major reason for cart abandonment. How do you yes. communicate the shipping options to people and this information before they get to the cart to reduce that abandonment? Yes. So uh, if you do have if you do have like uh, shipping costs, um, it's, it's really important to understand when to communicate that. Of course, uh, you should not communicate it in the beginning. You know but you should also communicate it too late. So you have to really make sure that you communicate this to the user that is about to buy and has a high chance of buying. So mm-hmm. pretty much if if you communicate this in the beginning, the user maybe has a high intent of buying, but then they see this and then just get uh, thrown off pretty much. So we do have actually, which is a really interesting topic, but like we do have some predictions um, at Behemix where we actually predict when is the right time to communicate the, the shipping costs. Or they are also like the, the vice versa case, when to communicate to the user that there is a free delivery or free shipping costs after a specific amount in the car. Because there are usually some conditions, for example, like uh, if you have if you have more than $100 worth of products in the car, there is free shipping. Mm-hmm. You know, so this is also very common. And this is the same story. If you communicate it too early, you're going to lose the sale because the, the user will say, like, oh, yeah, I mean, this doesn't, uh, I'm not going to buy $100 uh, dollars worth of products, you know, maybe they will, because maybe they will find something interesting on your store, but they, are, they don't know that in the beginning. So you should not communicate this in the beginning. You should only communicate when you believe that the user might add these products or might add hundred dollars worth of products later down the process. So all mm-hmm. these restrictions and everything that are related to the user, it's really important to not communicate them in the beginning. It's important to communicate them during the shopping process. When you believe that the user has an intent or has built an intent to actually buy. So these are like some of the, some of the cases that you should really be aware of. So in the beginning, the user, when the user lands on your store, the user has to only focus on um, on exploring your products, browsing your products, and, and seeing whether the user can find or might find something interesting, um, and not like not like deal with uh, with delivery costs and shipping costs and everything that are, that are important, the payment option, whatever. So they have to focus on on the products. They have to focus on the on the shopping experience. And that's why I said, the simpler the process it is, the easier for the user to make a decision. Because again, even if you provide free shipping costs, uh, a lot of coupons or whatever, and you have so many options for the user listed on your platform, it's gonna be hard for the user to make a decision. It's like, just, just imagine yourself, like it's like going to an exam and you see like, I don't know, like 200 questions within a page, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna lose you're going to lose your mind pretty much. You just going to, even if you know all the answers, you're just going to get stressed and you just fail the test pretty much. So yeah. that's the same story here. So, okay. Um, yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot here, right? I'm going to go, we're going to say, okay, imagine you know nothing about a website, right? You know nothing about the customers, right? I'm not going to tell you anything and you have to make a decision. I'm not going to, I'm not going to accept any, it depends from you, right? Imagine you had like a generic website and you have to advise someone who has a, They want to start up a new business and they've got no idea where their customers are. They've got no idea where their products are. And you have to just choose the average across all industries. What would you recommend them to do to reduce checkout, um, reduce checkout abandonment? 
Yeah, like first of all, um, fix all the technical issues. Okay, it's so what are the top thing. three things they should look for? Yeah, technical issues. Um, and what platform like, should they use? Yeah, so image, image uh, not loading, images not loading, uh, large images which can cause uh, speed latency. Make sure that the, the page loads fast, it's smooth. Um, make sure that the UI is, uh, is simple and clean and okay. not overloaded with a lot of options. For example, you see in a lot of shops you have, uh, for example, a lot of triggers, a lot of like uh, 10 minutes to to get a discount. It's kind of like time pressure nudges, you know? So you'd these avoid, are not like... You'd avoid that kind of thing, you know, like those kind of um, things where it says, you know, order in the next two hours to get next yes. Day, Yes, I mean these are these are really important. These are really important. But again, as we're talking about, when they use the lens on their store, when they use the lens on the store, the user has to focus on whether I can actually browse in your store. And for that reason, you have to have you you have to have a simple UI, a fast loading page, a simple transition. For example, make sure that make sure that you have a lazy loading, which means that uh, when you click a product. You know, you get forwarded right away and not like taking like four or five seconds to go to the product detail page. If you click the card, you get like transition fast to the card, for example, or have like a sliding in, slide in card type of thing. You know, these are like some simple UI tricks that can actually um, can actually have a huge impact. But the most important thing is like keep uh, keep the, the user interface as simple as possible and as clean as possible. Because this is the most important. This is the most important thing. If you provide a lot of information, a lot of content, this is like this is pressure to the user. So keep it as simple everyone. as possible. You think? Just keep get it as it. simple as possible. Yes. Okay. And so, what uh, should should this this theoretical person free shipping or not free shipping? Uh, free shipping is important. Yes, free shipping is free shipping is important. If you can provide free shipping, it's important, pretty much. So you should provide free shipping. Yeah. Okay. What about um I'm trying to <laughs> what about the cart page? Should it have um should the shipping you try and tell the user what the shipping is on the cart page? Yes. Yeah, so you if if there is a free shipping, then you should make sure that you highlight this from the beginning on. Okay. Uh but not flashy and not something like, yeah, this is our main value proposition to you, right? So the your value proposition are the products listed? Is a it's the simple, efficient UI of the store. This is the valid proposition. It's not the pre-shipping. There are like millions of other stores that provide pre-shipping. What, what kind of what kind of information should you have on the on the product page? Should you have? Because I've been I've been told that you should try and keep us have as much information on the product page, so these kind of so people don't need to click off the product page and go and try and find the return details or the delivery details. What do you think about that? Yes. So on the product detail page, you should you should definitely highlight um, the free shipping. You should definitely highlight, provide an option where they can read more about uh, what is delivery or the return process. How does this work? Um, you should also provide ratings and reviews. This is really important. Ratings and reviews have a huge impact because um, users want to know, okay, how good is this product? Because they, the ratings and reviews provide a validity to your um, a stamp, to your product and to your page, because it not only means that this product was bought, but it also means that other users bought from your store. Because usually what happens with small shops is that they are not known. You know, you click an ad and you land there and you want to make sure that other users bought from this store and it's not a complete scam. There are a lot of scams out there. And they don't want to. They don't want to fall for that. So ratings and reviews are really important. You don't have to. You don't have to put like a huge page of ratings and reviews, but you can get the top ones and and make sure that they are like about the fold, so that the user can actually see it right away. So these are like some of the important information, and um, and not try to upsell right away by recommendations. You know that that should be below the below the fold, prima. So. Uh, you should scroll a bit and then you should see the recommendations. But uh, but on top, on the first page, like, uh, ratings, reviews, maybe the top ones um, that you provide free shipping, that delivery or returns are possible. And it's an easy process of returning products. So these are like some of the information. If you have discounts, you should provide a discount. Um, 
but it's, it's, it's also really important because it depends a lot on the product you're selling. If you sell like electronics, um, ratings reviews are the most important thing for electronics, for example, right? Because um, you're buying something that is expensive and you really want to know if this um, thing will work or not, you know? So for, that's why re reviews and ratings are important. Um, and then you have to provide also some details about the product, whatever. But if you sell something in fashion, then um, then you can also go with recommendations because when you buy a t-shirt, maybe you want to complement with some shorts or something. You know, so mm -hmm. these are like some of the some of the cases where you have to to make sure what you want to do. If it's electronics, then it's less likely that you're going to get a complementary because the electronics they really cost a lot of money. You know, but with t-shirts. Or fashion, you can buy the, provide buy complementary the products. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, w would you be against having something? You know, because sometimes they have a, you know, people have a pop up which just before they go onto the checkout, which says, you know, have you considered buying these items? Would that break your rule and simplicity? Um, it really depends on how you trigger this. So, it, these are good, and we have seen that um, they really work well. But it depends on how you trigger this. If you trigger like all the time without any condition, whatever, this can cause you a lot of harm. But if you trigger it on the right time, this can provide, this can support you a lot because it's not only that, but it's also, you can provide a pop-up to, to ask for email or a phone number or whatever, so that maybe you can try to upsell later to email or phone number or whatever, right? So it really depends. It, it really depends on how you trigger this this pop up, and you have to make sure that you don't trigger it when you can actually lose the sale instead of getting the sale. Because users can get annoyed. Pop ups are not are not fine, right? Annoying. So they're not they're annoying. So okay, so you've got onto okay, so we've got onto the checkout, right? How many payment options? Um, usually um, like pay two. Two, three, four different options, but none more than that. Would like, you say, okay, so for example, a uh, credit card option, PayPal, do you think that's important? Uh, it depends. Uh, no, it depends no depends, well. no depends. We're not doing depends here. We've moved on from depends. Uh, uh, exactly, but like, <laughs> it depends on the demographics pretty much. For example, if you're from a country that PayPal is not widely used, then why should you provide that? Right, but okay. PayPal, yeah, but PayPal, PayPal is something that you definitely need to provide because it's like a fast option. And buy now, pay later. Um, if you're selling big orders. Okay. What about so, things like Apple? What about things like Amazon Pay or anything like? I don't know what other ones are. Yeah, these are also like these are also like we're trying to be days. So, so these options can also be um, can also be listed there. Yeah. Okay. I think I might have slightly run out of questions now. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else? Well, uh, I guess that's kind of like it. So I think we've I've picked your brains. Like, okay, I've got like let's let's do, you've done, you've done a good job. You filled all the questions. You batted. You yeah. you've done well. Okay, look, let's 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 uh, one last question. I like to ask a fluffy question at the end. What do you what do you do when you're not thinking about um, check out, check out abandonment? Um, painting, pretty much. So that's pretty yeah. cool. What do you paint? Usual nature. I like okay. to paint nature. Like I do have some techniques that I that I usually use. So I like to paint nature, like oil? something calm. Watercolors? Oil, yeah, yeah, oil, yeah. Okay. Do you uh, do you sell your paintings, or do you, what do you do with them? I just store them. I just store them. Maybe a gift to my kids or grandkids. So. Okay. Nice. That's cool. So you um, uh, do you do you? Do you actually kind of go out in the country to paint, or do you do it from a from a? Because you're new in New York, aren't you? Do you just you imagine the countryside? Yeah. I just imagine the countryside. You just imagine the countryside. So staring, staring at the concrete jungle. Yeah. <laughs> so you, a bucolic scene whilst from your from your apartment. Yeah, yeah. Imagining when it's, okay. it's refreshing, refreshing. Yeah. Excellent. Do you do you listen to a bit of Beethoven or something to to get you in the mood? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes just like listen to nothing, just like focus on the painting and enjoying the process, right? Because that's the whole idea of painting because you, you want to enjoy the process, right? You don't want to get distracted uh, with something else because that's like, the beauty of it, right? You just get calm and then just see, okay, how you can actually do it and try different techniques and think, okay, what should I paint now? Should I paint like a river or a bridge or... Uh, a small house or something, a tree here, you know, like just playing around, you know, I like, can see what happens at the air 
and trying to learn different techniques, which is also important. Maybe you paint a tree with a different technique last time and now with a different technique. You just kind of like try try new things out pretty much. So okay. that's that's a, that's the beauty of it. And then you see, okay, how should I paint the mountains? Should I go with the brush or like a different brush? Because there are like so many different brushes out there. And um, every single brush is specific to a specific technique and to paint a specific thing like a tree or a mountain or a bridge or whatever. So um, the whole idea is like trying to experiment with different brushes and techniques and see which one is, is better for a specific, a specific thing that you're painting right now. So, yeah. Okay, cool. I can tell you you're a great experimenter. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all yeah, I do, I, I do like that. Yeah, I do, I do like to experiment things. So yeah, there has to be a... Um, there has to be a uh, degree of randomness, I, I think, in your life in a way, because otherwise it's just like, um, yeah, it's kind of like straightforward and boring and there is no novelty here. It's like going to the same restaurant every day, uh, all the time, right? So maybe you risk going to a bad restaurant if you try to explore other things or other places, but the chances are also very likely that you might find a, a better restaurant if you do some sort of randomness. So randomness is really important. And this also should apply to making decisions. You have to leave some sort of randomness because- Have you, have you, this, had, the dice, have you had the Dice Man? Uh, I, I don't know that. You don't know that just, book? Okay, well, no. you, just, you, are, you are the Dice Man. So the Dice okay. Man, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a silly hmm. book, really, but it's about, it's quite a, one of those kind of slightly nihilistic um, 70s novels. And it's okay. about- you know, there's this character who decides to um, to live his life by rolling dice. So he, you know, should he, you know, shall I rob a bank? You know, one, two, three, yes, four, five, six, yeah. no. And he goes through the whole book doing that. Um, okay. It's, um, so what happens? Should I? Oh, should I, I don't know. Carnage. I mean, he's one of, you know, it, 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 it's, it's one of those fantastic, slightly misogynistic um um male fantasy 70s books which i don't think could get written anymore but it's kind okay. of kind of you know it's 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 escapism it's just some guy just just you know going around doing what he wants to do on a whim um okay yeah it's it's a holiday read <laughs> so yeah give it a go yeah. give it a go yeah That's maybe i'm time. a dice man maybe i'm a dice in a man little way in a small time. A, a little bit of dice, of man, time. is good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alan, good to chat time, to you. Yeah. Thanks very much for your insights. Uh, thanks a lot, Trevor, for having me. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.